Good to be with you again. This is Michael Millerman. If you're new here, from time to time, I do article readings on political philosophy, political theory, and everything like that. Today we have a nice article lined up called Resist the Machine Apocalypse, written by Ian McGilchrist, published in First Things, a magazine that you should definitely check out. First Things, March 2024. Okay, so let's go over it. You may know about Ian McGilchrist. If not, he's the author of some books on the hemispheres of the brain and how they affect all human arts and sciences. So far as I know, I, have, I haven't read them. I know he's done interviews with Jordan Peterson and other people. And I saw this article. I thought we'd go over it together. It's another one that I did not read before our live stream. So let's just get into it and see what we think. As usual, you should make your comments in the chat and you know, uh, chime in, see what you think. If he's on the money, off the mark, let's see. No two ways about it. We are making ourselves wretched. We are more affluent than ever, but riches and power, the only point in having riches, do not make people happy. Ask a psychiatrist or take a look at the face of Vladimir Putin, who has, alas, the power of life and death over millions of people and is the owner of the most expensive toilet paper dispenser in the world. Okay, did you know that? Uh, I didn't know that, the most expensive toilet paper dispenser in the world. I assume that he got that piece of information from Navalny's, uh, you know, the opposition member in Russia, Navalny, who was, uh, I guess, who died or who was killed. My understanding is, according to recent news reports, it was a blood clot. But anyway, he used to do long documentary films about Putin's wealth, and I think the most popular of those had something to do with Putin's toilet paper dispenser. So maybe that's where that claim is coming from. Uh, no, affluent as we are, we are also more anxious, depressed, lonely, isolated, and lacking in purpose than ever. What do you guys think? Is that, you know, this is a common claim, right? That we are affluent. We're also anxious, depressed, lonely, isolated, lacking in purpose. And I guess... This generalized we, you know, we, the Western world, we Western liberals, we postmodern man, we men um, and women of the new digital information age and all of this. And you know what? I've started to wonder how true this is. I guess people derive these kinds of claims from surveys. You know, ask a bunch of kids, hey, how often do you guys go out with one another and play games outside like you used to? And how much are you just sending each other um, you know, texts and videos and TikToks and all the rest of it. And so what do you think? Are we a more anxious, depressed, lonely, isolated, and lacking in purpose than ever? Why is this? Let's assume that it is. We'll go with the claim. You know, it's plausible enough, I guess, but still worth thinking about. Why is this? I suggest it is because we no longer have the foggiest idea what human life is about. Indeed, there's a sense in which we no longer live in a world at all, but exist in a simulacrum of our own making. Leaving nuance aside and condensing three decades of research and a vast body of supporting evidence into a phrase, we are now mesmerized by the least intelligent part of the brain. And let me just pause here. I think why he can leave nuance aside and why he can condense this is because he's got long books that make the case um, in great detail. If that's what you're looking for, here we'll just get the short version. We're now mesmerized by the least intelligent part of the human brain. For reasons of survival, one hemisphere of the brain, the left, has evolved over millions of years to favor manipulation, grabbing, getting, and controlling, while the other, the right, has been tasked with understanding the whole picture. You know, so it's like analytic and continental philosophy or something. So conflicting are these goals that in the humans, the hemispheres are largely sequestered one from the other. Our seeming ability these days to hear only what comes from the left hemisphere does not arise from the brains having changed radically in the last couple of centuries, though it is indeed always evolving. It is more like this. You buy a radio set and you soon find a couple of channels worth listening to. After a while, you find yourself listening to only one. It's not the radio set that has changed, it's you. In the case of the brain, it would not matter so much if we had settled on the intelligent channel, but we didn't. We settled on the one whose value has nothing to do with truth or with courage, magnanimity, or generosity, but only with greed, gambling, and getting, manipulation. Okay, so that's some very strong uh, right, <laughs> right brain propaganda against the left brain. Okay, the left brain has nothing to do with truth or courage or magnanimity or generosity, nothing to do with the big picture 
only to do with greed, grabbing, and getting. Manipulation It's funny because, you know, those of you who study the history of political philosophy or who have watched this channel for other reasons, you know that this is a common enough claim that the classical philosophers were concerned with comprehensive reflection on the whole and with all of the good things. And modern philosophers lowered the bar, narrowed it, turned our mental activity into calculation, contrivance, manipulation, and all of that. There's an account in the works of Leo Strauss and the works of Martin Heidegger, but here you're seeing them mapped on to the problem of the hemispheres of the brain. And no, he continues, the difference between the hemispheres is not a myth that has been debunked, as I have explained at length elsewhere. What does need to be debunked is the old pop psychology myth, where in the left hemisphere does reason and language and is dull but at least reliable, like a slightly boring accountant, whereas the right hemisphere does emotions and pictures and is apt to be flighty and frivolous. You guys may know, I think there was a book, uh, like a drawing with the right hemisphere or something like that. You know, so sort of the right is your artistic side, the left is your accountant side. All of this is wrong. We now know that each hemisphere is involved in everything, and that, for the record, the, less the left hemisphere is less emotionally stable as well as less intelligent, I mean cognitively as well as emotionally and socially, than the right. The right hemisphere is a far superior guide to reality. Delusions and hallucinations are much more frequent, grosser, and more persistent after damage to the right hemisphere than after damage to the left. Without the right hemisphere to rely on, the left hemisphere is at sea. It denies the most obvious facts, lies, and makes stuff up when it doesn't know what it's talking about. Oh, sounds like the Gemini AI to some extent. And it is relentlessly, vacuously cheerful in the face of disaster. All right, so he's setting up this distinction, which again, if you know his books, he's done in his books, but consider this our first exposure to his basic idea. He's setting up this distinction between the right and left hemisphere and just how crucial it is to rely on the right one and just how much of a gong show we have because we settled on the one whose value has nothing to do with truth, courage, magnanimity, or generosity, namely the left side of the brain. You may say, but so what? I don't care where things go on in my brain. It matters because each hemisphere takes a different view of the world and their views are not strictly compatible. And so when we reflect, philosophize, or discourse publicly, we're forced without knowing it to favor one quote unquote take or the other. What are these two hemispheric visions of the world like? You may recognize them from experience. Okay, so see whether this maps onto your experience and your judgment of other people's uh, worldviews. The left hemisphere, using narrow beam attention to one detail after another, sees what is familiar, certain, static, explicit, abstract, decontextualized, disembodied, categorized, general in nature, and reduced to its parts. All is predictable and controlled. This is an inanimate universe and a bureaucrat's dream. It is like a map in relation to the mapped world, useful to the degree that it leaves almost everything out and its only value resides in utility. The left hemisphere perceives everything as representation. To represent literally means to present a thing again when it is no longer present but dead and gone. That the left hemisphere does. By contrast, the right hemisphere sees not the representation but the living presence. So, you know, again, those of you familiar with Heidegger, even without going into the details here, very loosely would say, oh, okay, so that means Heidegger's criticism of metaphysics, machination, calculation, overly mechanical rationality, uh, and all of that, that is sort of the right brain's commentary on the left brain. So this could be an organizing model, you know, uh, it's a simplification, needless to say. But still, by contrast, the right hemisphere sees not the representation, but the living presence, bringing broad, open, sustained, Vigilant attention to bear on the world, it sees what is fresh, unique, never fully known, never fully certain, but full of potential. Ah, sounds like a bit of a dreamer. It understands all that is and must remain implicit, humor, poetry, art, narrative, music, the sacred, indeed everything we love. It understands that nothing is ever static and unchanging, that everything is flowing and interconnected. This is a free world, an animate universe, and a bureaucrat's nightmare. It has all the richness and complexity of that world uh, of the left hemisphere that the left hemisphere only mapped. You know, I'll tell you what. For me, it's not so straightforward because he said the right hemisphere is dynamism, among other things. It's always in flux. It's always moving, changing. Okay, it's energetic. It's creative. It's original. 
It has an intuitive grasp of the whole, but it doesn't freeze it. It's not bureaucratic. It's, uh, you know, a beating heart, a burning fire, activity. And the left hemisphere, abstract, frozen, cold, calculating, and so on. And you might think, okay, that distinction maps on to something. And again, I haven't read his books, so I'm like bracketing, okay, the full elaboration of his views there. But still, you could see it from a different perspective. This one. When Plato discusses Heraclitus, and even when Aristotle discusses Heraclitus, and the view that everything is in flux, you know, you can't step into the same river, and all of that, why? Because everything's constantly changing. So there you have the notion of everything changing, and he's mapped that onto the right brain. But Plato and Aristotle, they direct our attention to, let's take Plato, directs our attention not to the bureaucratic, administrative, abstract, cold, lifeless, heartless, frozen, manipulating rationality, but to those beings which truly are, and without which you somehow can't have knowledge, because knowledge requires stability of a certain kind. So it's like the simple disjunction, dynamic and static, doesn't map onto everything. Because in the Platonic version, the static gets you closer to the truth than the dynamic. It's more comprehensive, not less comprehensive. So I'd have to sort of dig into the details, as would you, you know what I mean? To see whether this actually fully makes sense philosophically, but we'll stick with the presentation here again. It's always helpful to have models on hand. Here's a model, left brain, right brain, and let's see how he stacks it up, okay? So the left hemisphere, we said, perceives everything as a representation, and the right hemisphere grasps the living presence. The left hemisphere is a bureaucrat, and the right hemisphere is a bureaucrat's nightmare because it's a free world and animate universe. Each of these two ways of seeing the world is vital to our survival. We must simplify and stand apart in order to manipulate things, deal with the necessities of life, and build a civilization. But to live in that civilization, we must also belong to the living world. This division of attention works to our advantage when we use both hemispheres, but it's a handicap, in fact, a catastrophe when we use only one. Okay, as usual, I'm going to interject here because there's a nice thought I want to share with you from the works of Leo Strauss, writing about Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So the idea is like this, you form civilization or civil society, political communities. Why? Like before you enter into a political community, what is life like? Now Hobbes and Locke maybe thought that it's, you know, Hobbes, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Locke has a slightly more benevolent view of what life was like before we enter into civic uh, organization, okay? Before we leave the state of nature and enter the state of civil society. But Rousseau had this idea that, look, the reason we form political communities, again, I'm simplifying, but it's going to be a nice point, I think. The reason we form political communities is in part because we have a desire for self-preservation. That's common to some of these other early modern thinkers as well. But why would we have a desire for self-preservation? It's because the sentiment of existence is a good one. Like, what is it about human life that we would want to preserve it? And therefore, we enter into political life, okay? That's why we agree to have laws infringing on our freedom. Well, we're trying to protect and defend the simple, bare enjoyment of living, a kind of immediate, natural, pleasurable sentiment of living. And that these two things, the natural, pleasant sentiment of living and the political order designed to protect that life, life and the desire to protect it, okay, that those two things are at odds because when you enter into civil society, you give up some of that natural freedom and natural pleasure for the sake of which politics is instituted in the first place. You know what I mean? So you get a sort of interesting split there. Man at war with himself in the natural versus the political state. And here we see a version of that mapped onto the hemispheres of the brain. Okay, the division of attention works to our advantage when we use both hemispheres, but it's a handicap when we use only one. And yet you see it's implicit. He doesn't go into the details, but look, uh, we have the survival. And for the survival, you need both the left and the right brain. But it looks like we want to survive because of the pleasance, the pleasant nature of existence, which seems like it's a right brain thing. Okay, anyway, hopefully you got the point, but let's go on. As I explained, and feel free to ask for clarification in the comments or say whatever you want to say. As I explained in the master and his emissary, he continues, 
Twice in the history of the West, in ancient Greece and then in Rome, a civilization started out with a fruitful harmony of left and right, but as it overreached itself, it moved towards the left hemisphere's take on the world and then collapsed. The same trajectory is now being pursued for a third time. After the miraculous outpouring of creativity in the arts, science, society, and philosophy that we call the Renaissance, our civilization has, since the Enlightenment, moved further and further to the left, meaning to the left hemisphere of the brain, drunk on the belief that it knows everything and can fix everything. We are like sleepwalkers ambling toward the abyss. Uh, Leo Strauss, I think, he's once characterized this view. Maybe I'm sure he took the formulation from somewhere else. But uh, for the modern Enlightenment mind, every problem in principle has a solution. Whereas for the pre-modern mind, that's not true. There are things that depend on chance, on providence, and that can't be forced. Like they're uh, in a lab there for our manipulation. You know. So if you think you can force everything, manipulate everything, control everything, if you think you know everything and can fix everything, according to this author, you are sleepwalking towards an abyss. There's a phenomenon in psychology called the Dunning-Kruger effect, whereby the less you know, the more you think you know, and vice versa. The left hemisphere doesn't know what it is it doesn't know, and so it thinks it knows everything. Okay, It doesn't have what Socrates had, to interject here, awareness of its own ignorance. Right, Socrates who said, to simplify what he said, right, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. It's more complicated than that, but he had an awareness of his ignorance, whereas the left hemisphere lacks such awareness. The right hemisphere, which understands far more, is aware of these vast unknowns. When we are functioning well, the right hemisphere tests against experience, the left hemisphere's theory about reality. But the left hemisphere's vision of a lifeless, mechanical, two-dimensional, geometric construct has been externalized around us to such a degree that when the right hemisphere checks back with experience, it finds that the left hemisphere has already colonized reality, at least for those of us who live a modern Western urban life. It finds a perfect simulacrum of the world according to the left hemisphere. Again, it's kind of funny, not having read his books, I can't speak to the brain science, which obviously a lot of this hinges on, but as an organizing model, it has these parallels in the other thinkers. Uh, I think you all know the idea of an overly mathematized world, lifeless, mechanical, two-dimensional, geometrical, and how in order to break through that, some people turn to mysticism, to poetry, to art, to everything that can't be calculated. And here, I want you to know that uh, I started writing on Substack. Okay, it's millermanschool.substack.com. And uh, not too long ago, so you see, I posted something on Dostoevsky, posted something on Nietzsche, on the body is a disgusting miracle because I was in the hospital for a while. But down here, this one, what is the human being today? Oh, no, excuse me. Uh, where is it here? This one. Language, logic, and love. I discuss this. I sort of had my musing on, uh, you see, I was reading a book on computers and cognition, kind of Heideggerian analysis of artificial intelligence. At the same time as I was reading War and Peace, and uh, I was reflecting on those parts of the human experience that transcend rationalistic language, okay, and uh, calculation and all of that, computation. So it's an interesting topic in general, what falls under the scope of computation, calculation, and control, and what doesn't, and why doesn't it. So here again, you have that presented through the model of the hemispheres of the brain. The things that used to alert us to the inadequacy of our reductionist theories are fading away. They were the natural world, the sense of a coherent shared culture, the sense of the body as something we live, not merely possess, the power of great art, and the sense of something sacred that is real but transcends everyday language. Okay, that's worth thinking about here too. The natural world, right? You can't just reduce, you don't have a reductionist view of the natural world until the left brain, or the left hemisphere, has draped a lifeless mechanical two-dimensional geometric construct over top of the phenomenological natural world. You know, in some sense, you could also say Heidegger was faced with this and he tried to recover this. Not only Heidegger, also Husserl and others. The sense of a coherent shared culture and so on, the power of great art and something sacred that is real but transcends everyday language. Okay, the holy love and all of that. AI... Artificial information processing, by the way, not artificial intelligence. 
So he's taking issue here with the ascription of intelligence to this information processing uh, thing. Our AI could in many ways be seen as replicating the functions of the left hemisphere at a frightening speed across the entire globe. The left hemisphere manipulates tokens or symbols for, an as for aspects of existence. The right hemisphere is in touch with experience itself, with the body and deeper emotions, with context in the vast realm of the implicit. AI, like the left hemisphere, has no sense of the bigger picture, of other values, or of the way in which context or even scale and extent changes everything. Okay, I want to show you that in this piece I was writing about uh, AI and Heidegger. You see the, um, I want to show you this, hold on. See, it's got Stephen Wolfram, mysticism, all sorts of crazy stuff, but wait, 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 because there's something important, which is, uh, huh, which is something about the body. Where is it? Hold on a second. Okay, I don't remember where I wrote it, but I got to tell you that the guys who wrote Understanding Computers and Cognition, this Heideggerian analysis of artificial intelligence, they also argued that until AI systems are embodied, you know, embodied, like you are embodied, they won't be able to have anything approximating understanding. And so you see that here too, right? He says that um, the right hemisphere is in touch with experience itself, with the body and deeper emotions. So until um, AI systems are embedded in something that can have a body, like a robot, robotic body, and, you know, there are interesting questions here. I'll try to find that source for you because I kind of took us off the rails and I forget where I wrote it. So let's go back to the article. But you may ask, can AI help us by relieving us of mundane tasks and freeing up our time? Of course, information technology saves time by doing things quickly. Or does it? Dun, dun, dun. Bosses save wages, but we become their new unwilling wage slaves. Meanwhile, with the automation of more and more processes that used to take a five minute phone call, we find ourselves entering into hours long commerce with computer programs that lead us into Escher like closed loops, only to report playfully, oops, something went wrong. Looks like he might have had a frustrating time himself the day of this writing. And if after this you stay on the phone so you can speak to a real person, the real people increasingly appear to have been so degraded by enforcement of machine like algorithms that they might as well be machines. All right, surely we can all relate with this to some extent. IT then is quite capable of making life worse. Needless to say, uh, this is already apparent in the increasing stress of everyday existence and in the many small signs that we're losing our connection with other human beings. This loss of connection has become much more obvious in the last four or five years and not just because of COVID. I'm laughing because I imagine the situation that somebody's on phone with an automated system you know, and you're going through everything, please press this, please press six, please press, ah, da, da, da. and then by the end, you know, you're back at the beginning and you're very frustrated, nothing got accomplished and you feel like smashing the phone, smashing the computer. And, uh, you know, we blame the information processing systems for that. And it reminded me, I was watching Curb Your Enthusiasm the other day, a show that you may or may not have heard of. And there's an old Curb Your Enthusiasm episode where uh, Larry David gets very frustrated because he got a gift uh, I can't remember what he got as a gift, but he got a gift and it's packaged in this sort of impenetrable plastic and he's getting so frustrated. He can't get through the plastic, you know, so that something can be so frustrating that you want to throw it, uh, smash it, stab it and punch a hole in the wall. It doesn't necessarily have to be information technology, uh, or information processing related as that episode comically demonstrates. Uh, but okay, fine. You know, this is all correct stress of everyday existence, losing our connection with other human beings, much more obvious in the last four or five years. As machines gradually displace people, and I don't think this means like everywhere, you know, machines are gonna displace people, but maybe in some places they will. You've seen clips on the timeline of Tesla robots walking around and, you know, this is their first iteration. What about when they get good? Okay, what about when they get good enough to replace people? Uh, my local supermarket replaced a lot of people with automatic checkout machines, whatever you call those. As machines gradually displace people, what happens to human flourishing? What happens when reliance on machines strips us of our skills, a process already well advanced? And what happens if for any reason, such as a shortage of resources, an extended power failure, the breakdown of civil order or war, God forbid, we can no longer rely on those machines consistently? How resilient, resourceful, skillful will we turn out to be when compared with our forebearers 
Leaving aside such alarming, but I think not merely alarmist possibilities, consider the impact of the loss of daily contact with human beings as more and more jobs become automated. What happens to those who are rendered unemployed? A few clever ones may get jobs in IT, but the economic drive is very simple. Machines are cheaper than people, so the aim must be to employ fewer people. Okay, see what you think about this. Not too long ago on the channel, I did a video by um, a video reading of an article by Mark Andreessen. I think it was called like the Techno Optimist Manifesto, something along those lines, or how AI will drastically improve all parts of our life. And here you have a counter thesis. You know, you have a, a clear anti thesis. All right, all kinds of concerns. What happens when we become over reliant on machines? What happens when that over-reliance is interrupted by some sort of shortage or power failure and we lack the skills that we need? Uh, what's going on there? And then what about our dignity? But before we turn to the question of dignity, and guys, I see there's stuff going on in the chat, which is great. I'll throw that up on screen as I always do before too long. But I want to tell you, you know, this fear that some sort of catastrophic failure is going to set back your technological development, it's not unprecedented, needless to say. <laughs> I got to stop saying what's needless to say, but it's also not just like 100 or 200 years old because in this beautiful book called The Laws of Plato, translated by Thomas Pangle, student of Leo Strauss, book that I mentioned from time to time, okay, I'm doing a course on at normanschool.com right now, The Laws of Plato, it has an incredible discussion about the origin and transformation of political regimes. Now, keep in mind, this book was written more than 2,000 years ago. And the way that the question of the origin and transformation of regimes is discussed is this. They say, let's imagine that you have a city, a coastal city, and a major flood destroys that city. And in fact, they say this has happened countless number of times in human history. There's not just one flood, one providential flood, one flood that is a crucial moment in the origin of the human story. No, there's constant cycles of catastrophe. They say a countless number of cities have gone through countless phases from revolution to uh, whatever you want. And they've been destroyed many, many times and been rebuilt many times. And the cycle is unpredictable. And yet we can imagine a city that's been destroyed by a flood and the few surviving remnants go and live up in the mountaintops, okay, no longer by the seaside. They're fleeing for their lives. They're afraid. There's been total destruction. And the arts are destroyed. And all knowledge of the arts is gone. What would be the situation of the people, the mountain herdsmen, living after the flood without the arts? Fascinating discussion, okay? But the idea that a catastrophe could destroy a technologically advanced city is there in that example in Plato's Laws. And it's obviously somehow a feature of the human imagination to consider that, or at least it's built into the general problem of technological progress, not only modern technological progress. What about our dignity as free individuals? Can we escape the appalling prospect already realized in China, Michael Christ continues, that wherever we go, whatever we buy, whomever we are seen with, our every word, every action, the very thoughts we express on our faces, all is monitored, potentially marked down against us, and whatever freedom is left to us curtailed accordingly. Is that a nightmare that you are afraid of? Do you think that's already the world we live in? I mean, I have a Mac and I use my fingerprint to log in. And I recently saw some article that, what did it say? It was something like researchers can now infer your fingerprints from the sound of your typing, something like that. Crazy, crazy stuff. Um, what do you think about that? Is that opposite our dignity as free individuals? Data tracking of that sort? We become non-citizens, un-people. Is that true? Just because whatever you buy is tracked, does that make you a non-citizen, a non-person? The only answer to this seems to me to be a kind of AI arms race in which the supposed goodies use AI to head off the AI of the baddies, which by the way is something Mark Andreessen also writes about. And here, this point you should know, okay, I asked the question, is it true that just because everything is monitored, we lose our dignity as free individuals? 
That's not self-evident. That requires a little bit of thought. I'll give you two quick examples. There's an argument in the history of political theory, especially in Republican thought, not meaning the Republican Party of the United States, but the general principle of republicanism, which places great emphasis on your civic identity and your civic duty, your role as a citizen, and your part in the Commonwealth. There's a old attitude in classical republicanism that you should, as much as possible, uh, strive to have things in common with the other citizens. And that your identity as a citizen of the Republic and your defense of the Republic from foreign oppression is an expression of your freedom. And the liberal idea of freedom is that you should have privacy. The Republican idea of freedom, again, in the classical Republicanism sense, not in the Republican Party sense, is that you're free when you're free from foreign domination and when you have self-rule. Not necessarily when you can do things without being observed. Uh, without leaving a fingerprint, without leaving a trace. So that's one thing to think about. Another, just super quickly here, I, uh, where can I show you this? Hold on a minute. I told you I've been um, allowing myself musings over on Substack, and there's this one right here, what is the human being today? That relates to what we're reading, because Heidegger wrote in the 30s, what is the human being today? That which he is accounted to be, oh, you should see that on the screen, and he is accounted to be the summary drawn from the answers to the many questionnaires addressed to him from all sides. The human being is the result gained through a gigantic calculative approach to him, right? Like totalitarian surveillance, right? Gigantic calculative approach. He is what is offered up by an index card file. You know, that's kind of like this idea that everything about you has been monitored, captured, marked down, you are what can be presented in an index card file. And the question that he asked upon that reflection, you see, I'll spare you everything I wrote about it. He said, will this human being still be able to encounter a God? Or more clearly asked, will any God still be willing to enter the atmosphere of this human being? So for him, there was something about human dignity that gets lost when we are nothing more than an index, uh, index card file because that part of ourselves or portion of ourselves or realm or dimension that exceeds calculation, it no longer can enter the picture. And therefore, we're deprived of some basic human dignity. So maybe there's something to it, okay? As I say, it's not self-evident even when it's persuasive. We become non-citizens on people. The only answer to this is that arms race of good and bad. I mentioned that Mark Andreessen has addressed that. But even in this scenario, who are the goodies anymore? the World Economic Forum, the problem with increasing the reach of human power is that it will sooner or later be used for evil ends. And once a pernicious regime's AI reaches a certain level, it can destroy any attempt to resist it, bringing the prospect of a totalitarianism that has no end. Okay, so another thing I can point out, should I? Um, hmm. In his book on tyranny, Leo Strauss had a debate with Kojev and they discussed the possibility of a global tyranny. And uh, global tyranny in the hands of uh, you know, high, highly powerful computer systems is probably going to be even worse than the worst nightmare, nightmare they envisioned there. Uh, okay, apart from that nightmare though, there is much to fear if we leave important decisions in the hands of AI. All decisions affecting humans are moral decisions and morality is not purely utilitarian. It cannot be reduced to calculation. Every human situation is unique. It's uniqueness arising from personal history, consciousness, memory, intention. All that is not explicit, all that we mean by the deceptively simple word emotion, all the experience and understanding gained through and stored in the body, all that makes us humans and not machines. Goodness requires virtuous minds, not merely following rules. It's worth pointing out that people with schizophrenia exhibit thinking and behavior consistent with left hemisphere overdrive and right hemisphere hypofunction. They see a world of bits and pieces, and they often imagine that people have become inanimate, machine-like, or zombies. To them, nothing seems real, and the world seems a simulacrum, a pretense, a play put on to deceive them. A person may look like a person, but uncannily isn't. 
To me, Miguel Christ continues, the belief that machines could become sentient is the obverse of the view that we sentient beings are really just machines. The psychiatrist R.D. Lang described a schizoid patient who saw his wife as a machine. Quoting now Lang, she was an it because everything she did was a predictable, determined response. He would, for instance, tell her, it, an ordinary funny joke, and when she, it, laughed, this indicated her, it's entirely conditioned robot-like nature. Okay, so this schizoid saw his wife as a robot. The assumption of mechanistic conditioning reflects what is hardly even a parody of a not uncommon scientific position. It also represents a chilling psychopathology, but this mentality is not unlike the way we may begin to see each other should the mechanical process of AI become the standard for human behavior. Now, let me ask you, those of you who have interacted with an AI system, large language model, let's take ChatGPT, for example, if you've really interacted, okay, asked questions, uh, treated it in a human-like manner, for example, please, thank you, do you mind, those kinds of things, and not just with brute, um, you know, in brute impersonality. So if you've had a quote unquote conversation with ChatGPT and then you log off and you go and you start talking to somebody else, do you find that you have some transference of, I mean, on one hand, when you talk to GPT, you transfer your typical way of conversing with other people. Otherwise, why would you say, please, thank you, do you mind, would you mind? Uh, you know, I once asked GPT to do some, draw some pictures for me. Oh, thank you, looks great. Would you please give it another iteration? And so on. So it transfers sort of our ordinary modes of human communication onto the interaction with ChatGPT. But do you find that you go in the opposite direction at all? That when you're talking to a person, you're like, oh, you know what? This person is really just kind of like a large language model trained on all of the TV shows they've watched and books that they've read and conversations they've had and podcasts they've listened to. And you know what I mean? Do you do that sort of thing? Like you've anthropomorphized the GPT. Do you... Um, LLMI is the person that you're talking to after using it because he suggests here, right? That uh, he suggests that this conditioning reflects a kind of a chilling or represents a kind of chilling psychopathology. And we may begin to see each other in this way should the mechanical process of AI become the standard for human behavior. As machines or so it is claimed become more like humans, humans are certainly becoming more like machines by reason of their being obliged to interact with them. The prospect of cyborgs is grim as well. Do you know who else of the authors I talk about on this channel is worried about cyborgs? Any guesses in the chat? Who else is worried about cyborgs? Alexander Dugan, okay? Post-humanism, transhumanism, big worry. The prospect of cyborgs is grim as well. The best way to destroy humanity would be to hybridize it with machines. Okay, kind of like machine-human donkeys. I do not call those who pursue this aim evil. They may simply have a failure of imagination or of understanding. But the aim itself is evil if we can call anything evil. It can only further degrade our idea of what a human life is for. And it opens us up to totalitarian control. We are like the sorcerer's apprentice in the story who knew the spell to set things in motion but had no idea how to make it stop. The genie of information technology and other advanced methods is out of the bottle and cannot be put back unless by a breakdown of, uh, of civilization, which is, I'm afraid, far more unlikely. So what can we hope for? Okay, so so far this is pretty bleak. Those of you who are listening, those of you who are here, those of you who are watching, is his concern exaggerated? Is it justified? Is it understated? Are things even worse than his worst case scenario? How real is this prospect of cyborgs? How much should we worry about something like that? The chilling psychopathology of interacting with human beings like they're machines. And is that being normalized the more our use of these tools becomes ubiquitous? Uh, where are we here? What matters for the future of humanity is imagination. Okay, I have to interject again. As I mentioned in my recent conversation with the good guys, the nice lads at the Russians with Attitude podcast, and as I've written about on my Substack, the topic of imagination is highly appropriate to invoke when thinking about AI. 
in particular because we have not only the large language models where the whole world of, so to speak, philosophy of language comes into play and everything you might be curious about, comp computational linguistics and meaning and sentence structure, grammar, syntax, logic, the relationship of language to ontological issues. Remember Heidegger said, language is the house of being. So large language models are fascinating linguistically, but the image generation models, not, I don't know their underlying architecture. I presume that I presume that is also to some extent linguistic, but it's imagistic. And therefore any studies of the imagination that we have could be helpful for us. And imagination is a huge topic because you have Henri Corbin, the scholar of Islamic mysticism and first person to translate fragments of Heidegger into French, has a work called Ibn Arabi and the creative imagination in Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi is a Sufi mystic from the 11th or yeah, 11th century. So the creative imagination, the imagination as a receptacle for divine energies, for intellectual uh, messages. Uh, anyway, the topic of imagination is a good one. I think that we should definitely embrace connecting, thinking about the imagination with thinking about AI, as imagistic AI for sure. So what matters for the future of humanity is imagination. The left hemisphere is often an impediment to imagination. And by the way, like you should know, I mentioned this in other contexts, I'll say it again here. As I learned through Leo Strauss, a great teacher of the history of political philosophy, there is a fundamental debate in the history of Jewish thought, Jewish philosophy, over the role of the imagination. Because Maimonides, a medieval, you see this book right here, uh, this big yellow book, that's Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. Okay, so this is where I'm, talk, this is what I'm talking about. He has an argument that says, in effect, a prophet is somebody who has perfected his faculty of imagination such that it receives the overflow from the intellect and gives it the form of an image, like allegory, poem, right? It can represent the immediate truth that it receives through the intellect in a way that becomes accessible for those who don't have direct intellectual apprehension, but who can learn to interpret an image. So a prophet makes use of the faculty of imagination in a sort of divinely ordained and highly fitting and appropriate way. Whereas Spinoza, who followed uh, Maimonides, criticized him, broke with him in many fundamental respects, regarded the imagination as a faculty of error, a faculty that misleads us, a faculty that has us imagine things that aren't true. He, he no longer saw it as the receptacle of a higher intellectual apprehension. He only saw it as that which allows you to combine things in your imagination that don't exist, that can lead you to error, you know? You know what I mean? So does the imagine what role does the imagination play? There's a debate over its nature and over its function. Uh, represented in the history of Jewish thought by the conflict between Spinoza and Maimonides, represented in Islamic thought, for example, as understand by the role of the creative imagination in the works of Ibn Arabi. And now we have to repose all of those questions for ourselves if, what matters for the future of humanity is imagination. The left hemisphere is often an impediment to imagination, and its goal is single and simple power. AI exists to make things happen, to give us control, but it's doing so is good only if we make progress in wisdom as fast as we make progress in technical know-how. Otherwise, our quote-unquote progress is like putting machine guns in the hands of toddlers. Nevertheless, if employed wisely, AI has the potential to be an enormous help to us. Above all, it may help us repair the damage done by industrialization, the destruction of the living world. It might help us devise ways of limiting and perhaps reversing the pollution of the seas or less destructive ways of generating power. Perhaps our dependence on power is part of the problem and we should aim to use less power in the future. And though he continues as a doctor, I believe in treating diseases, I also recognize that each of us will die of something someday. We must focus on quality rather than length of life. And here again, I believe AI can help us by addressing specific technical problems while keeping as far as possible out of our daily lives. Okay, so here he's put the constraint. AI can help us in the realm of specific technical problems, but it should not encroach on our daily lives. Okay, what do you think about that idea? Is that viable? Is that depriving 
our daily lives of the possible blessings? Or is it rather protecting our daily lives from the predictable harms of AI? Making the most of these new technologies will require us to grasp a paradox. To succeed at AI, whose purpose is to give us control, we must relinquish control, at least to a great extent. In other words, we must let go of those left hemisphere mechanisms, bureaucracy, micromanagement, and strangulation by systems. We must work with, not against nature. A gardener cannot create a plant or make it grow. A gardener can only permit and encourage the plant to do what it does or else crowd it out and stifle its chances to thrive. So, okay, you know, those of you who know classical Greek thought, uh, very much here we have the contrast between phusis and techne. Phusis, nature, self-emergent, and our realm of art, skill, and um, involvement. Humans, likewise, can only, be, can only be more or less impeded in our growth by external pressures. We need spontaneity, openness to risk, and trust in our intuition in order to exercise imagination and creativity and in order to be alive and truly present. So, if we wish to entrust the future to good gardeners rather than manipulators, uh, we will need people with intelligence and insight. So, I, you know... I kind of want to interject here. Just this is loose. This is uh, in passing. Okay. But this combination of insight and intelligence for a long time in my world, I have represented to myself as it's a, to some extent. Okay. There are many different models and many different ways of carving this up, but philosophy and mysticism, you know, because the tradition of the mystics has always been something along the lines of a comprehensive grasp you know, a grasp of the whole, an inner illumination that illuminates not just the inside, but everything else as well. And that is not somehow deductive and not mechanistic or process-based, but that is a flash of intuition that inspires your imagination, you know, that has this creative element to it because somehow you're touched by the heart and mind of God in that moment of mystical insight. And so, you know, even the other day, I showed you again, I have my sub stack. I was reading Dostoevsky up here, the idiot. It can be dangerous to read Dostoevsky. I wrote, why? Precisely because of this right here. I was writing about the mystics flashes of divine lunacy. I don't know whether you can see that on screen. Yeah. The mystics flashes of divine lunacy because uh, there's a description of that in Dostoevsky's idiot. You know, and Socrates says the greatest of blessings come to us through madness when it is sent as a gift of the gods. So there's a nice way in which you can think about intelligence and insight in terms of, you know, rationality and the and sort of, I you know, mysticism, I would say is an adequate way, of adequate first approximation. Let me go back to the article though. Uh, if we wish to entrust the future to good gardeners rather than manipulators, we will need people with intelligence and insight and we will need to give them time. Stop breathing down their necks. Stop asking how many papers they have published recently or how near they are to a patentable product. It is true that if you trust, sometimes you will be let down, but more often you will be handsomely rewarded. By contrast, if you monitor and control, you will never get more than mediocrity. So we can think about, um, we can think about this, the Gemini AI fiasco. If you monitor and control, you will never get more than mediocrity. But what if you monitor and control with wisdom and insight and intelligence? Okay, that is a problem. Always because it's a problem in the history of political philosophy since... Uh, can I show you that or not? Well, politics is a realm in which you need some control and you need some monitoring. And the old question that Plato raises in many of his works, including the laws, what does it look like to have intelligent or wise monitoring and control and what's really funny those of you who don't know the book i'm teaching it i talk about it you can read it with or without my course but the um, conversation of plato's laws to make the point about control and to make the point about monitoring and the difference between an institution that's monitored intelligently and one that's monitored without intelligence they go through the example of a drinking party yeah they compare a poorly run to a well-run drinking party Pretty amazing. 
What makes life... Oh, sorry, hold on. I think I skipped a line here. We cannot afford mediocrity right now. You know, I hope, guys, I, I know I interject every two seconds, but that's just... That's just what I do when we read these articles. So I want to tell you this right here. Look, we cannot afford mediocrity right now. I want to remind you of something. I think you should find this interesting. One of the great things when we read these books together and articles and talk about Dugan, Strauss, Heidegger, Plato, uh, McGilchrist today is the connections, similarities. You know, sometimes there will be a model that's kind of like this one, but not the same. We try to figure out what's similar and distinct about them. Well, this reflection on mediocrity, if you were here for the morning's live stream, if you weren't, it's okay. We read this 1977 speech by the father of the nuclear Navy. And even then, he was lamenting the tendency towards mediocrity and saying we have to guard against it by reading good books and by encouraging ourselves to strive to be intelligent. It's funny just how these themes recur. Okay, we cannot afford mediocrity right now. Can we ever? What makes life worth living is what can only be called resonance, the encounter with other living beings, with the natural world, and with the greatest products of the human soul. Some would say with the cosmos at large or with God. Only in encountering the uncontrollable do we experience the world in its depth and complexity and come fully alive. The resonance we enjoy in a real relationship with a sentient other is not possible where there's no freedom, no spontaneity, no life. And here we have our closing paragraph, then I'll put your comments on screen. So feel free to make uh, any additions, you know, any um, express your counter arguments, your opinions, your experiences, your thoughts. If we are not to become ever more diminished as humans, we need to remain in control of machines, not come under their control. Okay, I got to show you once more because I love, I love it when the targets uh, of our analysis and when the concepts underlying them recur. So. Uh, give me a second here. I was reading out loud a few days ago, Alex Karp of Palantir. Silicon Valley has a Harvard problem. I don't know whether you're here for that, but look at this. Watch this. Trust me, let me just close. Okay, we go to the bottom, all the way to the bottom. Very last thing that he said. He said, The dystopian future that Orwell and others have imagined may be near but not because of the surveillance state or contraptions built by Silicon Valley, uh, by Silicon Valley giants that rob us of our privacy or most intimate moments alone. It is we, not our technical creations, who are to blame for failing to encourage and enable the radical act of belief in something above and beyond and external to the self. Okay? Not our technical creations, but we are to blame for failing to encourage belief in something above and beyond and external to the self. And then you go to McGilchrist. If we are not to become ever more diminished as humans, we need to remain in control of machines, not come under their control. It is we. I am not now talking about an apocalyptic future. I'm talking about apocalypse now. We are already calmly and quietly surrendering our, li surrendering our liberty, our privacy, our dignity, our time, our values, and our talents to the machine. Machines serve us well when they relieve us of drudgery, but we must leave human affairs to humans. If not, we sign our own death warrant. And how do we do it? We do it through the encounter with the greatest products of the human soul, with other living beings, with the natural world, with the cosmos, with God. By encountering the uncontrollable, we experience the world in its depth and complexity and come fully alive. Okay, that's exactly the sort of thing I was reflecting on in my Substack post on language, logic, and love. Okay, we're all in the same conversation here. We're trying to understand. We have these new technologies and they are doing something, something intellectually interesting and engaging and thought-provoking. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. They seem to be concentrating power in the hands of a closed elite and that's potentially concerning. They can be controlled by dogmas like the Google Gemini fiasco, which if you didn't see, you can look into. And yet clearly there are parts of life where it seems obvious that they could genuinely benefit somebody. I mean, if you could use these new information processing systems to screen for a disease earlier than you could do otherwise and to treat it more effectively than you could do otherwise, is that so bad? You're going to say that because you don't want Google Gemini to give you DEI-based images, 
Therefore, we're not going to use information processing technology to help people screen for cancer more successfully or to predict Alzheimer's more successfully and to treat it more successfully. No, so how do you cut and carve this up? It's not an easy question. Uh, although at times we may think it is. On one hand, the extremes who say, yes, go all in on tech progress. And the others who go, no, leave me completely out. Well, no, the truth must lie somewhere in between those two extremes. And that's why we try to cover the optimist case, like Merck Andreessen's piece, for example, and the relatively pessimistic case, like the machine apocalypse that Ian McGilchrist has cautioned us against in this piece published in First Things magazine, which you should definitely go look at. They publish a lot of great work there. I have published with them before my introduction to Alexander Dugan. So please do go look at First Things. And that was that. Now, I would like to put your comments on screen. And let's see some of what you've said. So first of all, I'm Michael Millerman, as you know, millermanschool.com is where I teach courses. You can subscribe to my newsletter on Substack or to my mailing list where I send all kinds of updates and offers and things like that. And I have this channel where we do article readings and talk about political philosophy, mysticism, uh, political theory, and lately AI and various authors like the great Plato. So to go through the comments, uh, Roshad says, my work has helped you wrap up your dissertation and discover Strauss, Bloom, and Bernadette. Bernadette, Seth, that's fantastic. I'm happy to hear that. Congratulations on wrapping up your dissertation. And those of you who are here who don't know, Leo Strauss, Alan Bloom, and Seth Benardetti, you should look into them. There are many different ways to get into their works. You might start with Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind or with his translation of Plato's Republic. Same with Leo Strauss, many different starting points. My general mantra, start anywhere and keep going. That's the best way because as I tried to show you in this stream, everything relates to everything else when you think about it. Um, esoteric writing. I don't know exactly what that was referring to, what part of the article you're referring to there. If you want to clarify, go ahead. Uh, Fred says, I haven't prepared. Why would you watch? Fair enough. Good question. If you don't like unprepared live streams, then you shouldn't watch. Uh, Ziryab says, Ian McGilchrist and David Bentley Hart are two of your favorite people in the world right now. Cool. If you have anything by David Bentley Hart that you would recommend or that you'd like me to go over on the channel, you should uh, drop that in the comments. I'm not familiar with his name and I don't know his work. Uh, Simon's talking about the science of bodies. Yes, the science of bodies, the embodied nature of understanding and cognition, the relationship of the body to intelligence and knowledge. I mean, there's an old history there too, because Aristotle in On the Soul, when he discusses the act of intellect, has been interpreted as suggesting and saying, though there is some dispute over this, that there is a component of the human soul by which we apprehend the higher truths which is separate from the body and separate from the lower parts of the soul. It's separable, you know, that there's something non-bodily about our highest intellect. So that's like, you know, that's a thing. Um, and Nietzsche, you know, Nietzsche in Thus Spoke Zarathustra talks about, uh, talks about the body in ways that are hugely relevant to this question too. Okay, Paul writes, funny theme, dear Michael, all these modern and postmodern approaches and theories pale away when compared with what old Indian rishis found given to them in yoga. Greetings from Bali, Indonesia. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thank you for your comment. Um, I do think it's profitable and anybody who has the time and uh, access to the sources should definitely consider, as I say, like we have different models and we can see what comes to light using any of those models. So I'll give you an example of a book that I once read and it gave me a model for understanding that I could use to compare with others. It was called Kundalini Tantra. And it looks like, uh, it looks like this. Oops, hold on a second. I'll show you the book. Now, I don't teach it. I don't know. I don't know it well enough to teach it, you know, but it was an example of a book that gives you something to think about as far as, oops, I made that. Not very visible, right? Anyway, there you go. Kundalini Tantra. Because it talks about the various chakras. And for example, you could imagine... Okay, I'll just show you. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I like to think about from time to time. Let's say... It's not going to be very clear on screen, but clear enough to make the point. Like, here's the heart chakra. Okay. 
And here's the sort of higher intellect chakra. Okay, this is where you get your big flashes of, this is the epileptic mixed stick flashes that I talked about when writing about Dostoevsky. But this is sort of like the highly concentrated conceptual knowledge. To my mind, this is sort of like Hegel, okay? And uh, here's the art, uh, articulated speech. Okay, so I, my understanding is that, for example, in the yoga systems, like Raja Yoga, for example, would have something to do with the higher abstract conceptual faculties here. And all right, and so on. In each chakra, you could imagine, what if each political ideology or political philosophy or worldview or mode of interpretation correlated with a chakra? So you can imagine somebody, just imagine this is completely off, off, turned off. Okay, the switch is off. This switch is off. This switch is off, but these ones are on. So a person's heart is wide open, their solar plexus is wide open, their sacral chakra is wide open, and maybe their root chakra is closed. So you could even sort of imagine, what would that be like from the point of view of a moral, ethical, political world interpretation? If your heart was open, your root was closed, your higher conceptual faculties were closed, and your divine inspiration you know, coming top down, crown chakra, chakra was closed, and vice versa, Imagine somebody who this is blown open for them. Like they have, they are bathed in the rays of God right on top of their head. They feel it. They close their eyes and they're in a mystic heaven instantly. And they have conceptual uh, concentration and comprehension and apprehension and all of that. And they can articulate it, but their heart is shut down. And they're sagro, you know what I'm saying? So that's like, that's good. It's good to have models that allow you to think about these things, and that may be true. But, you know, the model of the hemispheres is a simplified model. Uh, to repeat, I haven't read his books. Okay, I have to state that over and over again because his books are big, well researched, dense, and presumably make this case at length over thousands of pages. So, I don't want to uh, reduce him to what he's written here. That wouldn't be fair. But at the same time, you know, for a minute, we take a simplified model where all you have is left and right. And left is calculative, mechanistic, reductionist, abstract, lifeless, mechanical, cold, manipulative, schizo, <laughs> schizoid, and so on. And the right is comprehensive, understanding, okay, so on, so on, and so on. So that's nice, but here we have a system of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven possible distinctions. And each of these can be turning, let's say, uh, correctly or incorrectly, and then all the permutations. So you have a rich system there, possibly of describing, anyway, whatever, I kind of got off track there. Let's go back to the comments. So thank you, Paul. Uh, then there's a discussion between Roshad and Ziryab about McGilchrist. And then Paul talking about textbook for practice is this book here. Also something Tantra, Vinyana Bareva Tantra. Nice. Uh, another comment by Paul. Thank you. I appreciate it. About Yuval Harari. I did write about him somewhere on my uh, on my email list, which I ported into my Substack. So I have something about Yuval Harari on my Substack. Uh, Simon writes, Simon writes, all art in general is extension of human bodies. So is AI. As Elon Musk said, be good to AI and it will treat you good back as well. It's not guns that kill, but humans who make it shoot. Uh, and Paul about Kundalini Tantra from the same basket. Nice. Okay, so very, very briefly, let me just remind you what we did. We looked at Resist the Machine Apocalypse by Ian McGilchrist in First Things Magazine, published March 2024. I read it over, commented on it. I also shared with you the fact that I'm writing about some of these topics on my Substack, millermanschool.substack.com, about mysticism, language, love, computation, uh, literature, Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, and so on. This is the author of the piece we read, Ian McGilchrist. You should learn more about him if you found that intriguing. Psychiatrist, neuroscientist, researcher, philosopher, and literary scholar. This was an article I read another day, but we referred to it because there was a similarity in its conclusion. Silicon Valley has a Harvard problem by CARP. And this was the book I mentioned at the end, Kundalini Tantra. All right, so I'll leave it at that. I do recommend 
you go to millermanschool.com and there will be a pop-up about a newsletter, subscribe to it. Get my updates, subscribe to this channel if you like it, comment, share, make it easier for people to find this and we can have bigger groups and uh, more heated arguments if that's what you like. Uh, and I'll see you in the next stream. Goodbye, take care, be well. All the best.